I'm Jordan. And I'm Chantal. We're so glad that you can join us for this Good Friday service in a moment. Our kids always ask us, why do we call it Good Friday when Jesus died? Uh, well, it's good uh, for us uh, because he died to pay a price for our sin that we could never pay for ourselves. Uh, Peter wrote, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. So Christ also suffered when he died for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners that he might bring us safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. On Good Friday, one of the things that we usually do together is take communion. And we usually do that in the same building together, uh, which we can't be in right now. Uh, so we're inviting you to participate in communion uh, wherever you are when you're participating in this service. Yeah, this is super unusual for us. I definitely have not done communion in the living room with just Jordan before. But I feel like um, the time that we're living in now, God knew about it and he foretold it. And he knew that this would be something that we experience. And when he wrote, where two or more are gathered, then he's with us. And I think that that means for us here in the living room together, but it also means that he knew we were going to be connecting online like this. And he knew that maybe you'd be sitting by yourself in the house and that you could participate in communion with us through this medium and that he would still be with us. And so I'm so thankful that we live in a world where we have the ability to do this and we can still meet and we can still remember the most important thing and the most important gift that God has ever given us. And that is his son and that he sent him to die on the cross. And today is a day where we get to remember that. And I hope that in this time and through this service that you'll have the time to just really focus on the gift that God has given and the sacrifice that Jesus made. Communion is about uh, celebrating Jesus' death and his sacrifice for us, celebrating uh, the life that he offers to us through that. Uh, so at any point uh, during the service, you're welcome to go in and find for yourself, or you can pause the video even if you want. Great thing about the way we're doing this. Uh, and you don't have to find a loaf of bread, you don't have to find grape juice or wine. Uh, find a cracker or some type of bread-like product, uh, some type of drink, uh, something that you're going to enjoy together. Uh, communion is a lot less about the specific things that we eat, and it's about participating and remembering and doing something together uh, that focuses us on who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then at the end of the service, uh, we'll come back and together uh, over a video like this, we'll take communion together. Yeah, the point of it is our hearts. And whatever medium that you're using, if you're using that to remember the broken body of Jesus and his blood shed on the cross for you, and that's the point. So I pray that through this service and the worship that you experience the presence of God, and you're, you're drawn in the reality of what Jesus did for us on the cross.
God created and said, it is good. All the beauty of the world, all the beauty that calls our admiration and our gratitude, our worship at the earthly level, is meant as a set of hints, of conspiratorial whispers, of clues and flickers of light, all nudging us into believing that behind the beautiful world, is not random chance, but the loving God. And if we are created in the image and likeness of God, then whatever good, true, or beautiful things we can say about humanity or creation, we can say of God exponentially. God is the beauty of creation and humanity multiplied to the infinite power. For in him we live and move and have our being. Imagine the infinite, infant world in all its perfection. Imagine what it was like when every single relationship, people with God, people with people, and people with earth was utterly perfect. Unfortunately, it didn't stay that way. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The fall, the fall. Oh God, the fall of man. The fruit is found in every eye and every hand. Everything is broken now. It began years ago with one decision. But it remains to this day how do you see brokenness in the world, in your own life situations, and, and in your own heart? This stone represents the heaviness of sin in our lives. It sometimes doesn't feel very heavy when we first pick it up, but when we carry it for a while, it becomes incredibly burdensome. It takes away the freedom that you were meant to have. That same freedom that came with God's perfect creation. That same freedom that was lost when sin entered the world. That same freedom that required God's perfect plan of rescue and redemption. Moving in the midst, and we're. 
worship you, worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are we maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not follow it, fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. And he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. And the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. Jesus knew all the pain and suffering that he was about to experience. Can you sense his anguish? Do you feel his struggle? Yet he says, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't a spur of the moment decision. He deliberately chose to take the journey to the cross in spite of the great cost. Is there an area of your life where you need to make a choice to love and to sacrifice? even if it comes with a cost.
one called Judas Iscariot, went to the priests and asked, What are you willing to give me to deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. While Jesus was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. How much is your integrity worth? Would you betray a friend for $20,000? We seem to compromise our values so quickly for money. After Pilate had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on Jesus' head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Some deaths are quick. Some deaths are noble. This death was neither. It's one thing to kill a man. It's another to shame and humiliate him. Think for a second that the King of Heaven has spit on his face. Oh, the divine disgrace of our Savior.
and they came to the place called the Skull. They crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Jesus talked a lot about loving enemies and forgiving others. But at the cross, he goes beyond words and ideals. He teaches us with an example, with the nail digging into his flesh and the hammer hovering. He offers forgiveness. So in your life, who are the soldiers with nails and hammers that you could extend forgiveness to?
It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Imagine you're standing at the foot of the cross with the disciples. Can you feel the presence of death? Can you feel the heaviness of despair? Can you feel the sorrow, emptiness, and confusion? Can you feel the darkness?
later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Try to imagine the emotion of the disciples as Jesus' body was laid in the tomb. What's it like to go to the funeral of the one you thought would save, the one you thought would be the Messiah? The death of Jesus, it shattered every belief his followers had about who God should be. Think of the beliefs that you have about God. That the cross forces you to confront. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. A decisive end to that sin, miserable life. No longer at sin's beck and call. What we believe is this, if we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin, but alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected to the old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Thank you.
stand here at the table, the Last Supper. Here is where it all started with bread and a cup and a promise. This bread and this cup is about that body and that blood. This bread and this cup is about a new covenant between God and you. It's about righteousness, given, not earned. It's about God fixing the sin problem once and for all. This bread and this cup is about how he so loved the world. It's about his faithful forgiveness. It's about his reckless grace. This bread and this cup is about no more condemnation. It's about remembering that your sins are forgiven. This bread and this cup is about how everything is now moving towards how it is supposed to be. I am forgiven. You are forgiven. We are forgiven. There's always a feeling of heaviness at the end of a Good Friday service. Whether this is the first time that you've had this experience or whether you've sat around the communion table for a thousand times, the truth of Good Friday is supposed to be heavy. It's a time where we focus on the loss and the sacrifice and the gift that God has given us through his broken son. Jesus' followers didn't know what was next. They thought that was the end, that Jesus died, and that was the end of their hope. But we know different. We know that there's more to the story. But I hope that when we look forward to the end of the story and we look forward to the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that we have in him, that we don't forget the sacrifice and the great gift that the Father gave so that his son could die and that we could be in relationship with him. So if you haven't had a moment to get cracker or bread or something else to eat with us, uh, go ahead and pause this video and do that now. Uh, get some juice or wine or anything else that you have to drink in your house and then come back and we'll do this together. When Jesus sat around the table for the last time to eat with his disciples, uh, he took a loaf of bread uh, and what he did was he broke it and he passed it around the table. And he said to them, whenever you do this together, and I believe that means whenever you eat together, uh, as people who are trying to follow Jesus with your life, uh, when you're eating and when you're together, remember my words and remember my sacrifice on the cross. Because Jesus knew what was coming up. Uh, what he did is he, he took the broken bread. And, uh, he said, this bread represents my broken body uh, that I'm going to give for you on the cross. He didn't say it in those words, but Jesus knew what was coming. So when we take this, uh, we, we take this remembering Jesus' life uh, broken and given for us. God, we thank you so much for the gift of your son. We thank you for his broken body. Thank you for everything that you gave in order to have a relationship with us and for his obedience on the cross. We thank you for this bread that represents that. So go ahead with whatever it is that you're eating to participate in communion. Go ahead and eat it. After the bread, he took wine, passed the glass around the table. Uh, similar to the bread, he said, this, this drink represents my blood poured out for you. So when we drink together as the body of Christ, as followers of Jesus, uh, we drink this, remembering his life poured out so that we can have life. God, thank you for the, your son's blood, for Jesus' blood shed on the cross for us, that we have new life because of his sacrifice. So go ahead, whatever it is that you're drinking to participate, go ahead and we'll drink together. God, I thank you for every person watching, participating in this moment of remembering. God, I pray that wherever they are, 
that they will know your love for them, your peace and your presence in their life. God, in the solemn moment of Good Friday and communion, remembering your death on the cross, God, I pray that you would fill our life with your life. You would lead us as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We love you. We bless you. Thank you for coming and joining with us today.